welcome to the GoTo Podcast. Each episode covers the brightest and boldest ideas from the world's leading experts in software development. Tune in for practical lessons, compelling theories, and plenty of inspiration. GoTo gathers the brightest minds in the software community to help developers tackle projects today, plan for tomorrow, and create a better future. Stay up to date with the latest in tech through GoTo's top-rated events held online and in person in cities like Amsterdam, London, Copenhagen, and Chicago, and by subscribing to the GoTo Conference's YouTube channel, where you can find thousands more high-quality dev talks. Learn more at gotopia.tech. Hi there, uh, and welcome to today's edition of the uh, GoTo Book Club. Uh, my name is Damien McLennan. I'm a consultant CTO and software architecture trainer and uh, with a company called Stack Mechanics, and I'm based in Brisbane, Australia. Today, I'm talking with a fellow Australian and Brisbaneite, Ashley Davis. He's recently re uh, released a uh, second edition of his book, Bootstrapping Microservices with Docker, Kubernetes, GitHub Actions, and, and Terraform. Um, so, Ashley... Why don't you tell me a little bit about your background in the software industry and what led you to write this book? Oh, well, first of all, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for uh, joining me, Damien. Um, um, you know, I know that you've got a long history in kind of what we're going to be talking about today as well. So I'm really, really excited to, to talk to you about it. Um, I've been a developer for over a quarter of a century now. So, uh, you know, I've been, I've been around a bit. Uh, I've done all the languages, <laughs> at least... Um, hopefully all the important ones. Uh, so I've worked a bunch across, I've, I've, across a bunch of domains, worked for a whole bunch of different sized companies from, from startups to, to the biggest internationals, uh, and, um, worked with a lot of different, I guess, ways of, of structuring software and, um, microservices, or I think more appropriately distributed applications is, I guess, you know, mostly where I'm at now. Although, you know, I still consider myself, uh, I mean, I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time in startups, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a constant dabbler in, in mm -hmm. like yep. anything and everything you can imagine. So I work yep. across the And you the have stack. to be, to, to maintain a career of length, you have to be a constant dabbler and always reinventing, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, like front end, back end, um, you know, I love some of the, some of the problems that, that sort of come into play in distributed applications for really interesting stuff, interesting problems to get your head around and to find, you know, solutions that only add as much complexity as, as is needed to, to kind of yes. manage, to manage the complexity really. And, um, and to keep it just simple enough, like, you know, not, not to over engineer it basically. So, you know, we, we have complicated problems to solve and, um, you know, try, trying to solve them in ever more simpler, but more effective ways. Which kind of leads me to, and I want to dive right into into some of the sort of nitty gritty of microservices. But um, your first edition came out in in January 2021, um, which is a little over three years ago. Um, so, what brought about you writing the second edition? Was it was it industry trends? Was it based on feedback or just an update of the tools and better techniques that you saw out there? Yeah, well, I mean, you don't you don't get to write a second edition unless the book's popular in the first place. So. There, there was that, <laughs> and you know, yep. micro, micro, having microservices on the cover helps with that. Even though you know, I mean, it, it it it's a book for working with any kind of distributed application, really. And and microservices is just one end of the extreme, you know, of choices, um, which I'd like to talk about some more as well. But absolutely. So yeah, um, so so Manning, um, who I've worked for on a few books, you know, came back and asked me to do a second edition and. I I'd loved working on that book and um I and and I didn't you know like nothing like that is ever finished <laughs> you just at some point <laughs> you kind of have to say have to ship know, it this is enough it's like Sh software ship it. and yeah and so I had like I had feedback coming in while I was writing it that I couldn't address I had feedback coming in after I'd published it because I you know if people reach out to me um you know I I'm I'm always happy if I can you know in the time to actually jump on a call and you know talk people through like what they're trying to achieve and you know like why they're having trouble if they're having trouble and so i've got a lot of feedback that way as well and uh, made a lot of interesting connections with people that way um and then you know things changed <laughs> like things changed in the industry um software was updated um terraform reached version one um <laughs> like 
Uh, I mean, Doc has been around for a long time, but when I first started writing the book, it, I wasn't sure whether Kubernetes was really going to be, you know, like the king of microservices or the king of distributed applications. And it seems, you know, as much as I can tell um, that, that it is now at least. So there was, um, you know, like I, I put, you know, and, and since I wrote the first edition, I became a... a like I, I got a qualification in, in terms of becoming a like a what do you call it like a certified Kubernetes developer. So right. I'd re I'd really pushed my experience with Kubernetes like further along, done a lot more stuff in production as well. So all that influenced it, and and also I found simpler ways of doing things. So in the first edition, you know, some of the examples are, are more complicated than they needed to be, and um, and through writing the second edition, I was able to kind of come back, revisit that, and simplify it, and. It's it's still effectively the same result, but just um, you know code and examples that are, that are a little bit simpler, and uh, you know and and hopefully I've come up with you know because I think about it again and and get a chance to kind of revise it and and go through all the whole feedback process as well that um, uh, Manning organised, which is a really good yep. way of writing a book. Uh, that um, you know the explanations are hopefully are better, are clearer, and are yep. more to the point and. Yeah, so um, you know, Cause, doing cause that's the, the thing when you when you explain the same concepts over and over again, you come up with shortcuts to saying things. You come up with better analogies, and and yeah, so that's something that yep. I'm certainly familiar with as well. And like you said, a lot of the tooling's improved. So some hoops you may have had to jump through four years ago, there's a shortcut for them now. So yeah, yeah, fantastic, for sure. sure. So it's all yeah, it's all about finding better ways to do things, more effective ways to do things. And and for me also, it's you know finding more effective ways to teach things in in terms yes. of the, the writing of the book. Absolutely. So as an architectural style, you know, microservices have gone through the full hype cycle. You know, we had the sort of really early adopters. They gained some real traction, saw some you know a lot of real world usage, and then everyone wanted to jump on that bandwagon. Some of those people learned some very expensive and very painful lessons. Then we see people a little bit more hesitant, and you know, so in when is when is a microservice architecture the right choice? Like, what what makes a good candidate for a, a microservices architecture? Like, that's a really hard question to answer in in a general way. You know, it, it like not everything needs to be microservices. I mean, I think you know you know part of part of the problem maybe is that microservices have been pushed on a lot of people, and people are being developers have been forced to use microservices in situations that you know didn't didn't call for it so i think you you've got to think really uh you know really deeply about whether microservices are are the right answer to your question and i i i'm actually you know i want to talk about this this more in a bit but I, like i'm somewhere sort of more in the middle now so like if you ask me microservices or monolith i'll say somewhere in the middle um and it, i think it's a great place to be to basically get the most out of out of both those different ways of working, um, and then and then you get to choose to use microservices for for features or for aspects of the application where it matters. So it's not like saying, you know, here, here's a here's a here's an app, and you should definitely use microservices for everything. It's like here's an app, and it's structured in such a way that things that can make have you know make use of the benefits of microservices can be spun out into separate services and. I've um I've got like a list of examples of things that have worked really well for me in like yep. in production applications that I've built. Like um I worked I've worked on a couple of different applications that needed to run AI models. So pre-trained AI models like, you know, something you load up into TensorFlow. And, and not only does that maybe can you know the stack, the tech stack you have to use for that conflict maybe with the tech stack yes. you actually want to use for the for the customer endpoints that the customers are directly talking to to kind of um, use the web application or the mobile mobile application or whatever whatever it is the back end's talking to. Uh, so you want to we, you know, for those AI models, we always wanted them to be separate. It was just like like it was so obvious that you want to spin uh, kind of uh, an AI model out into a separate service because then you can kind of control the performance of it and the you know the problems that it has. Like you can have some sort of uh, fault isolation. So if you spin yes. that that kind of thing out to a separate service. Um, you can scale it. You can throw a GPU at it. Um, you can, yeah, you, you can prevent any problems that are happening there aren't going to be affecting the customer. So I think that that was one of the first things that um, I was like, yeah, like this is, you know, a place where it's cut and dry. You can you can put this 
kind of thing in a microservice and you know run a dozen a dozen of them as many as you That's need right. to kind of it's get, a great, get yeah. throughput. It, it's a great use case. Any any computationally or time expensive processing that you can offload onto an ASIC process and build it into an isolated space that's yeah fault tolerant and not not so time sensitive is going to make your general app scale better, perform better, right? It's a yep. it's a sort of a and, an um, easy win. You know, one of the applications I worked on, the, one of the ones that had um, AI models in it, was was a, a general kind of asset processing system. Like you could, um, a, as an extreme example, you could upload a video to it, and then the video would uh, like there would be a, a, like a, a process that could chop up the frames of the video, do IO, um, AI analysis on individual frames, you know, pick a pick a, a, a thumbnail for the video at somewhere in the video. Yeah, I mean, th- this this is a, an example of something that could be quite performance intensive. That if you're set up in the right way to use microservices, even if you've got a monolith, even if you've got like most of your stuff in a monolith, um, you can kind of spin this one thing out to a microservice, and suddenly you know your, your performance problems uh, are gone, and you can kind of keep that separate. Um, you can run it at, uh, at at a really low priority if you want to save money, or you can spin up ten of them if you want to get the throughput. Yep. So again, you know, performance fault isolation, and we we had we had say like twenty of these services. That could handle different types of assets and do different kinds of processing on them. Like you would upload uh, an audio file, and it would do it would spin off a service that could do the the transcription of it. So that was that was just talking to um, something in AWS and basically waiting for a transcription to come back. But there was just something that you kind of like hold off from everything else basically, and and keep it at a at a distance as it were. So that that kind of that kind of thing worked worked really well. Um, I, I've worked for a, a blockchain companies, and you know there, there's been a there's a need for security, and kind of you know ring ring fencing you know certain transactions on the blockchain, or uh, ring ring fencing um, any data that that's any financial data or any kind of keys or, or secrets that um, you don't necessarily want the rest of the the, the wider organization to be able to access, like the yep. security reasons to spin off things yes. like that yes. in, in separate services as well. So that's a really good example. I've I've had some similar experience um, working in a compliance space where we had sensitive data, and, and again, through building that off into separate services, we could completely isolate and ring fence around that data. So it's a really good example. And of course, you know, there's there's reasons to use microservices for you know reusability and you know composing systems together as well. I I, I, w- I would say never do that um, just for that reason. Like like don't split off a microservice. Just because you think it might be good to reuse it, it's it's like you know in any kind of coding, you can you can always go overboard with um, like componentizing things or yes. creating creating abstraction layers and stuff like that. But I mean, a, a really good example I've got here um, is like uh, having a separate service for doing email notifications or something like that, or like um, SMS notifications, because that's something that possibly a lot of other services in your system want to want to reuse. And so it it makes sense to kind of spin that out as a separate service, but I like like I said I, I would never do that just for because you know it's good for reusability. Like there, there, it has to be that there is a need for that reusability. Not not that's just- right. Any any good abstraction is going to come from working software. If you start with the library or the framework or the service first, you're very likely to get that modeling entirely wrong. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. So that, that that kind of thing, I think, can come as as you build it, like because you've got other reasons, like what we've talked about, for, you know, for performance or fault isolation, or um, security reasons. And um, I mean, there's a list of benefits, right, to, to using microservices. Um, Absolutely. So you know, we, I don't know if we want to kind of tread that path. Well, yeah. So what haven't we covered? We've covered we've covered performance. We've covered security and compliance. We've covered isolation. We've covered reuse. Do you see any others? You know. Yeah, well, on my, on my list of benefits, where these are the, personally my my top two, and and there's like you know like a world of discussion probably under each of these, but um, one one is that that I, I I really love that I don't know how well it's um, appreciated or kind of understood by people, is being able to build a system or design a system so that you can kind of replace it over time, and so that that's really hard to do with a monolith, like with a monolith, yes. you're kind of you're, you're you're stuck with what you've got for a long if it's successful and versions <laughs> of frameworks and yeah 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 but uh, with with microservices you know any anything that you've carved up into separate processes um, then you've got 
like uh, basically a way forward in terms of like, okay, that, you know, replacing them one at a time with, you know, wh whatever, like if, it, if it's changing the tech stack to something newer, it's just like, uh, like done really badly. Like, like each service, you know, yes. um, I, uh, what, what, one, thing, one thing I love is that uh, microservices can be like um, little islands of tech debt. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, but and, it's encapsulated <laughs> tech debt, right? It's like it's isolated yeah, 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 tech yeah, yeah. debt. No. And, yeah, yeah, that's and, right. And, 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 it, and it's already set up so that you can kind of throw a piece of it away and replace it with something better. Yeah. And like you said, even, even just like framework versions and, and Docker makes that really easy because it used to be if you wanted to upgrade a framework version in, in an organization, you would have to upgrade every build server and every developer machine and, you know, you, your build chains would have to change. And now you can just say, okay, well, I'm, go I'm touching this service today. So I'm going to bring it to the latest and I'll bring it to the latest Docker image to host it on. And that's a very isolated change and it doesn't affect all of the other things. So you never have those, let's rev the entire enterprise yeah. um, projects, which are awful. Obviously, there's some anti-patterns that can can break that, <laughs> which yes, is, sure. I think we'll, we'll talk about soon. But um, but yeah, just just being able to design the system, you know, so that the parts of it can be evolved over time in, yes, in a way that the, the the system itself doesn't break. Um, so I think, and and you can keep it running. You know, while while you do that, you can you can basically hot swap in new services for old services. Um, you can add if you've got a like a, a protocol like. Uh, what I was talking about before with the asset processing, you can have a running system and you can add new types of asset processing to it on the fly by creating and deploying a new microservice. Absolutely. So one thing we haven't touched on that, that is a real benefit is the, the people side of it in that you can have smaller teams that if you've got your general modeling right, can work on a small piece that has, you know, it might have some technical debt, but it's isolated technical debt you don't need to understand the side effects of the entire enterprise to work on the one yep. service. You can kind of fit that domain problem in your head quite nicely. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so I mean, well, like one of the common benefits that we're, we're probably not even going to talk about is, you know, microservices allow not, not just scalability for performance and, and that for the granular tunability of performance, but scalability of the of, team of and, and, and having a team of teams. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, I yep. mean, that, that was just on my list of benefits to skip over, to be honest, because I think that's, but yeah, I mean, it was, it, well, it's not, it's not appropriate for everybody. Like these patterns, like you said, can be used by anybody, but certainly in, in, in much bigger organizations. So as long as there's some sensible thinking around how you do that, it certainly lets you scale up your, yep. your development organization. So uh, the other thing that I wanted to cover, like just on the, you know, on the the last thing really on the benefits, um, is that microservices, you know, a, lo a lot of people think they cause complexity. A lot of people think I'm not going to use microservices because they're going to make things more complex. Like I've got bad news for those people because applications get complex no matter like like what happens. Like they're gonna they're gonna tend towards complexity in a big organization, a big company that's got a huge customer base. So I don't think you can like avoid complexity like you, you just need to find ways to to manage it so that it doesn't really stunt your development process and stunt your release cycle um Absolutely. And I, think, I think that's what where microservices can really help is to is to help you manage that complexity so it's like taking something that is going to be very very complicated and and chopping it up into smaller simpler manageable parts and I think I think there's some techniques for that, and I actually want to get into that in in a moment. I've got got one more question first, but uh, a lot of that is in how you structure your development environment and how you structure your code base. And I know you've got some really good stuff in the book about, it, so I might come back to that in a moment. But um, let's take it to a slightly dark place first. You know, we we've talked about the benefits and we've talked about hype cycle. You know, I know and you know, there's a lot of people out there that have that have had some fairly expensive failures and some some messy lessons. Yeah, what are the main pitfalls that you see out there? I think, you know, mic microservices, like I've said up front, they're not suitable for every project. Um, they're not suitable for every team or every every use case. It's like if, if you, you've got to think really carefully about, you know, the cost versus the benefits. So you, you've, got to, you've got to basically justify whether, whether microservices are, are going to deliver value. And if they deliver more value than they cost you in terms of investment, maintenance, skilling up, and you know management of the tech and stuff like that, then they're going to be useful. 
Um, but if it's the other way around, if if they're going to not deliver a significant value for for the effort you have to put in to kind of build that larger distributed architecture, you're going to have a bad time with microservices. Um, and I I think you know that that's a big part of it. Uh, like it, it, microservices is not just for scaling up performance and development teams. The difficulty level scales as well. So. I, I, what I, what I'm sort of liking to tell people now is that, you know, if you're having problems with your monolith and you think that microservices is going to solve that for you or mi microservices is going to solve all those problems, it's not, it's going to matter. That's whatever, right. That's whatever, right. Whatever, whatever yeah. problems you have with your monolith will be magnified. Yeah. If you can't successfully, quickly, iteratively deploy and ship your monolithic app, you're not going to be able to do it with 20 or 30 or 50. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You've got to solve your your hygiene first, right? I, I think the experience of probably a lot of people, which results in microservices getting a bit of a bad name, is that um, whatever problems they have just get scaled up by ever, however many microservices they have. And but but you know there there are ways to do it where you don't have those problems, but you kind of need to solve those problems early. Um, yeah. You know you, you can't wait till you've got a hundred microservices to start solving you know automated testing, automated deployment problems. Um, you've got to have a really nice process, a really nice refined um, pipeline, and it's yep. got to be rock solid as well. So, you know, no flaky build processes, um, no flaky deployments. Um, those things can be rock solid, um, but I think if they're an afterthought, if I think if you you wait till there are problems to address them, then that that's when you've got like a huge it's problem gonna that's, that's going to hurt a lot to, to to be able to solve that problem. Yeah. So, um, but you know, like, um. I think any any complex system is going to be hard. It's going to be hard to manage uh, a complex m monolith, you know, as as it grows bigger and more complicated, and has more people kind of touching it, uh, and you know, more. more there's uh, so in, any development process, any project can be hard. It can be it can be complex to to get around. I think microservices can help, but you know, only really if you've got your house in order, like um, first, and and of course, um, you know. With distributed applications, you have you have new problems as well. Like so, um, you know, there's a trend towards making systems more ob observable these days, and and being able to better understand how things are talking to each other and how messages are passing through systems. I think that's a really good trend. Like it's still obviously still something that we're working on as a community, um, but that that kind of like understanding what your application is doing as a whole uh, and debugging the whole, obviously it it scales up with with microservices so you know that that's i think that's a work in progress still and you know there, there's 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 still room for improvement there it's absolutely essential and you, you are right you know the the advances in in you know observability and tracing distributed tracing tooling um is is absolutely essential now to do this you know the the days of Grepping through log files on servers in a distributed environment is just not, you know, that will let you down when you need it. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Any other major pitfalls you that you see out there? I mean, some of the ones that I've seen are uh, the ones that the, the two really that I see a lot of is relying on shared databases. Um, yeah. And the other one is making things very synchronously chatty. Um, yeah. Yeah, and people just end up with, a, you know, just dominoes. <laughs> I'd sort of put that in a slightly different category, but the, the whole shared database thing is like, you know, you, you when you create services, you want them to be loosely coupled, right? You, you don't want them to be sharing details that they shouldn't be sharing. And that that's how you can kind of build a system where it's, you know, easier to change one thing, but not have ripple rip, ripple effects like across the system through the different services. So that, that, you know, loose coupling, like having them know as little about each other as possible. Obviously, that's completely destroyed by sharing a database. So I, I would say yes. that this is the, <laughs> the cardinal sin of microservices is to share the database because um, that that completely voids any any benefit you'll get from from microservices. I I think there's a there's a scalability uh, issue there. There's you know it's it's a it, it's like um also you, you get a similar problem from using too much synchronous communication between services. You get this kind of fragile system where if one part, part of it breaks, the rest of it breaks. And it's like, I think it's what they call a distributed uh, monolith. Have you heard that one? Yes. <laughs> yep. You know, so so being too synchronous, um, sharing a database, um, deploying everything in lockstep, 
uh, like there's, there's plenty of ways to do microservices uh, wrong. Yeah, well, that's right. Those two, the, the synchronous and sharing leads to you having to deploy things in a very specific way. Yep. So one of the, one of the primary advantages of microservices is that you can deploy them independently so that you can have se separate teams working on them and parts of the system can have kind of small um, small deployments of microservices and you don't have these big bang releases that you get with with a monolith but if you've got this kind of what we're talking about this sort of distributed monolith where it's a distributed system but because of you know the way you the way you've structured it like there's so much depends on everything else you get these kind of yeah, these. You, I wouldn't be surprised if you kind of fall back to kind of these big bang releases, and you know everything either works or it doesn't. And um, absolutely, and, 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 you're, and you're removing benefits like the you know the, the reliability benefits and and the fault isolation. That's right. Benefits. The fault tolerance goes out the window. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, um, I've I've seen um, as well like um, what I, what I'm thinking is an anti pattern, and 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 I think it's all in the name, the name microservices. I think is just kind of wrong. <laughs> like, I think, I think, I think because, you know, people, people don't really kind of get it. It's, it's more about kind of, you know, some sort of logical single responsibility pr principle for the business, like not, not the technological concerns. And so the natural thing is, oh, it's going to be, it's going to be micro, right? It's going to be micro. So make it as small as you can. So, but that often leads to these systems where the services are like a too small. And um, yes, and and you've talked about this. I've heard you talk about you know services being too chatty, and I I love I love the way you the way you said that when you did. Uh, but you know, you, there's there's a massive network cost to pay for for these things talking to each other, and and there's just it the system is is more complicated than it needs to be. It's more complex than it needs to be. So, you know, when when you have that, when you have code or a system that is more complicated than it needs to be, more complex than it needs to be, then you've you're in, you're putting a, a larger cognitive load on the people that need to kind of understand it and and move it forward. So it's like a cognitive tax, really. And so that's yes. um, you know, like I think I think there's, there's 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 somewhere in between, like like really small and too big. <laughs> there's somewhere there's like a happy medium somewhere in between. And I think where people go wrong is they get so excited about we're going to do microservices now they forget modeling. You know, there are some fundamentals and some basics yep. that will never go away, no matter what the stack. And that is, you need to learn how to model your software and you need to learn how to model your domain. And far too many people get caught up in some new fad and they really forget about those fundamentals. Because all of that is described by modeling. It needs to be modeled around the business and, you know, yes. and, and, and what the customers actually need from the software. Yes. You know, ra rather than around technical concerns, obviously there's going to be a a ton of technical concerns that you need to deal with, but I mean that's that you, you sort of you have to come to that really through through that process of, of modeling and to understand you know wh how you're going to kind of divide up uh, the system the way it's going to be divided up. Yeah, and this has always been the case. This is not a new problem. <laughs> it's yeah. just we repeat the same mistakes with every kind of technological evolutionary yeah, but, step. But <laughs> but the new thing with microservices is that it's scaled up to a much bigger proportion. You like Yes, cost you, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. So so look, how 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 do we do it right? You know, you in the book, you know, I know you've said look, here is a lot of the ways to do it. Like what are some of your, you know, you know, five three or five tips of, of how do we do this right? Yep. Uh, there's a bunch of boring stuff here, like that, that we're, we probably don't need to talk about about you know getting development right generally. Um, one thing I'm a big believer in is being able to test things locally, you know, before testing in dev, before testing in staging, you know, before rolling it out to production. So it's like a like a hierarchy of testing, where you know it's 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 so much easier to test locally if you can get a setup for it. Um, that you're going to be a lot more effective if you can work locally first. You know, before you get your PRs into into dev or into the next yep. um, staging after that or QA or whatever you call it. Uh, so I think I think that's like I I think people have forgotten that. Um, <laughs> like I think people have forgotten that you know we we can run these systems locally at least. You know, if if it's a huge system, we might have to run it in some cup down form. If we're running it on our local development computer. Um, so there there are ways to do that. But I think in general, like people think. Um, it's an effective process to work in the cloud. And may maybe it's just because we're in Australia and kind of maybe used to <laughs> bad connections to the cloud, <laughs> like that we, that we have a, 
that we care more about it. I don't know. Like, well, I, I certainly care about it anyway. Getting microservices right. I mean, it like I've, I've I've talked about this already, but it's like you know, do they do they deliver the value that kind of outweighs their cost? Because if not, then you're guaranteed to have a bad time. And then next, you need to kind of look at your you know your skills and experience. Like if if you're learning how to do distributed applications and microservices while building your first production application, you well you have you, to learn these things. You have to make mistakes and then correct for it, right? So you have to go through a series of mistakes and failures. And that's 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 not a bad thing. That that's how we we learn. That's how we should learn. And we shouldn't be afraid of making mistakes or, or failing. But it can be really hard to do that from from nothing, from having no experience to to actually doing that on a production application. This is where we need to bring in agile principles, right? We want to fail fast and learn from that and iterate and you know adapt as we learn. You know, it... I, I'm talking more about I guess as a as a personal developer, like, and this is where my kind of book can help. It can help you kind of, you know, work through some yeah. of those, some yeah. of those early technical choices and mistakes, um, and, and plot a route to production. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's, uh, it's about like, how quickly can you deliver results for the customer that yeah. work, that work for the business. And so it's about plotting a course through the technology to, to basically to, to reach that point of success of delivering features to customers quickly and uh, you know but that's a minefield right like w walking mm. through the through the <laughs> design patterns and the best practices and the silver bullets i'm not just talking about microservices here but you know walking through that technological landscape is a minefield that can you know take you take your legs off if you, if you step yeah. on one of them so um like and again that's 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 what my book is for like i i sort of learned the hard way and you know, wanted, and and this is the book that I wanted myself, but it didn't yeah. exist. Um, so there there are plenty of theoretical books on on building with microservices, um, and they're great. And, and I've I've read a bunch of those, and I and I love them. But you know, they don't give you that practical guidance of how do you kind of navigate this, um, you know, this treacherous pathway to to, <laughs> to, act, to actually being You're getting the first one into production. Well, it's 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 sort of about being technically competent because I mean there is the the bar of skills. Uh, are just much higher for microservices than, you know. Well, there's a lot more. Like, I mean, just in the title of your book, you've got Docker, Kubernetes, GitHub Actions, and Terraform. Like, that's a lot of pieces. It used to just be you wrote code. Yep. It might have gone to a build server, and then somebody put it on a server. Yep. Now, you know, there's a there's a whole ecosystem of tooling that you need to understand and make choices around how you'll get your app into production. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, like like crossing that gap, crossing that, that chasm is 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 the hardest bit. Um, so, but once you get some experience and once you start to, you know, you'll build your own toolkit of recipes of of how to do this, that, and the other. And my the the, the book that I've written is is full of my recipes, my recipes that I've yeah. used in production. And and I and I point out early in the book that it's just it's just my recipes. Like it's your recipe. Book. <laughs> like 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 once you've gone down that road for a couple of years or, or more. You'll have your own complete set of recipes for for all the yes. all the kinds of things that that work for your business and your your customers and your team and your so, and your aesthetic, your sense of style and your taste as well. So, I mean, other than buying your book and reading your book, what should people do do next if they're interested in working in microservices in their company in their team and they haven't done it yet? Yep. Read the book. Yep. What else? What's the what's the next step? Uh, I mean, if if you're just learning by yourself, then you know, practice building something. Um, so that way you can kind of, you know, have the time and the scope and, uh, you can make mistakes and, you know, not, not be under the pressure of actually having to kind of release things to production. Learn so production. <laughs> I think, you know, I, I like, I, I'm always a big fan of having ho hobby projects. I mean, that's, I, I've learned more from hobby projects than I have ever learned on the job. And I, yeah. I constantly have a hobby project on the go and I use it to teach myself like the latest things, the, the latest ways of working and, and tools and stuff like that. And, and then sometimes write, write books about it. Um, but you know, like all that learning sort of goes into what I do day to day in production as well. Um, it's just the, the day to day stuff is it's, it's gotta be a lot safer. Yeah. I mean, you can't take as many risks uh, of learning new things and bringing new technologies into play, you know, when you're, when you're working on a, on a job, that's you know that's got, right when customers are paying. <laughs> but if you do your own stuff on the side you, you can take those risks and you know have make really bad mistakes and <laughs> and, and, and have really good learning from it and have no less fallout from them yeah yeah that's right in terms of bringing microservices into a company i'd, I'd say uh tread very carefully because 
look, the reality is, is um, you know, we, we have a lot of choice between monolith and microservices. And, and also even further, you could say that functions as a service are like a step on the spectrum beyond microservices. There's a yeah. lot of choice there. And the reality is that that most production applications uh, in the wild are like they're, they're not they're not conforming to um, what what you think is an extreme or like what you think might is an, is an ideal for for what reality is never pretty. Yeah, it, it, it's always a mess somewhere in the middle and somewhere. Um, yeah, but I, I think the tools in the in the book can can really help you know those situations where tame the mess. Yeah, tame tame the mess, um, tame the distributed system. You know, be be set up to to appreciate that it's okay to to be in the middle and have you know services of different sizes. You know, some are small, some are big. Some some there might be a couple of monoliths in there. Um, I, I actually call it the hybrid model. So where where you have like a monolith or a couple of monoliths, and then a constellation of little microservices uh, around the edge. Yeah, and just I've supporting noticed, I've, pieces. Yeah, I've noticed a few people starting to talk about this as well. About you know, it, it's not about which, which end of the spectrum you're at. You know, it's it's okay to be somewhere in the middle and yep. um, be, be in a position where you can leverage the best of both worlds, basically. So, you know, there's a lot of convenience about using a monolith. Um, it's, you know, it's it's all there. It's all together. You, it can all be tested at once. Um, you've got access to everything without having to do kind of asynchronous messages or, or REST API calls. It's, it's a lot simpler to work with. Um, but then, you know, if you're set up with something like Kubernetes, um, you can easily pull bits out of that. And, and just make break pieces off as you need to. As you need to, as, as a business need arises for it. Um, and I think, you know, you're, you're set for hopefully success if, if you can position yourself to, to to not care about these religious wars of monolith versus microservices yeah. and, and actually take whatever the advantages, whatever the benefits you can from, you know, every possible situation. And, and, and that, that's why I think that actually the word microservices is probably outlived its usefulness like um i've talked about this before on, on different podcasts that you know we, you know it should be it should be called right size services it's like whatever whatever is right for your situation like there's there's no there's no microservices police out there that are, that are going right. to come and look at your code and tell you your services aren't small enough that's right stop worrying about it. there's a lot of those terms that just get so much uh baggage attached to them that they lose their usefulness right <laughs> Mm, yeah. So look to wrap up. Um, what's next for you? Are you working on new books? Any big projects in the works? What's next? Yeah. Well, I'm I'm currently finishing uh, my my third full book, which is called Rapid Full Stack Development. So, it it kind of a bit like how bootstrapping microservices, you know, sort of cross cuts the world of distributed development. I'm trying to write a book now that basically cross cuts the world of um, where the app- application development front to back, and also talks a bit about using Electron for desktop applications and um, Capacitor for mobile applications um, using web technologies. But it, it's not really about what, you, what you're building. It's about how to be more effective and more productive at doing it. Um, so that that's rapid full stack development. That's what I'm, I'm finishing up at the moment. It's available now, like for a discount. So if you want to get on board like a couple of chapters before it's the finished, early access. Yep. Um, please search for rapid full stack development. And um, one thing I'm... I'm Toying with the idea of doing is making a video course from uh, bootstrapping microservices. So, if anyone is interested in how the book might translate into a video course, like a very hands-on, practical thing, just like lo- just like the book, then uh, please take a look at uh, bootstrapping-microservices.com. Um, sign up to the email list, and you know we can we can chat about uh, you know how how I can help basically help you understand how to build distributed systems. Amazing. All right. Well, I think that's all we've got time for today. So, look, thanks very much, Ashley. That was a really interesting chat and good luck with the the second edition of the book. It's it's amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of the GoTo Podcast. Head over to gotopia.tech to discover lots more content from the brightest minds in software development.